three Georgians have grown through a great and terrible depression, cried as four wars stole our loved ones and felt the burn of racial and religious intolerance. We rode the roller coaster of King Cotton, then watched the fields turn to woods and woods fall to highways. We've seen the heavens open in torrent and man walk on the moon. We have nurtured politicians with names such as the wild man from Sugar Creek and Axe Handle. We survived various and sundry leaders and witnessed one of our own, a peanut farmer, become our nation's 38th president. Such shared experiences define what it means to be Georgian. People, places, and events that spark a memory uniquely ours. Today's Georgia, vibrant and forward-looking, presents a different face from the state of decades past. Turn back now and take a journey into vanishing Georgia. I heard of people taking a rabbit's foot for good luck. I don't see where that can bring any luck. Ethel Korn. Rural Georgia in 1935 was caught between a rock and a hard place. The hard place being the family farm. The rock, the prodigious boll weevil and plummeting cotton prices. Conditions were oppressive. Out of 48 states, Georgia was ranked 45th in wealth, 46th in education, and 43rd in health. A huge migration was underway as half of the state's labor force abandoned farming for non-agricultural work. Many of those who stayed behind labored on small farms as sharecroppers. Author Erskine Caldwell recalls that these families were as bad off as toads in a post hole. Uh, we'd go right about the time the sun would get enough to where we'd get to do off of the cotton. Usually didn't like to pick it when it's still wet. But then sometimes we'd pick on after dust and, and until it got to, uh, too dark to, to stay in the fields. Take uh, very few breaks. We'd carry our uh, lunches and, and paper bags with us to, to the fields and, uh, and uh, our water. And uh, we'd sit there all day long, sometimes a, a 16, 17 hour day. And my mother and I, uh, she, she was the best at it. We could pick a bale every two days. And people tell me today we were excellent cotton pickers. And I came down and worked on the farm for him in summertime. I was, I was, uh, he was being real generous with me. He paid me five dollars a day and he paid the rest of the hands three dollars. And he kept reminding me how, how generous he was being with me. But it was kink to kink. We're talking about can't hardly see in the morning, can't hardly see at night. That was a, a work day and grown men were just making 50 and 75 cents a day. You know, uh, we were so poor, uh, at least part of that time, that, uh, in the time of uh, thunder showers or rains, uh, we'd have to find some buckets or pans because the roof would leak. I remember laying in the bed at night and a clear night, I could see stars through the roof. Uh, so it was really um, uh, kind of um, uh, primitive back on our farm. My son and I, and the grandson, we're farming about six to eight hundred acres now, and we don't have tired eggs to help. Back then, uh, it took a huge family to make a living on a farm. Despite the extreme hardships, people made time to help each other. As Alice Rose wrote, If anyone was sick, you'd chop their firewood, wash their clothes, clean their house for them. Love your neighbor as yourself, and you know, we believe that here. The occasional luxuries that were squeezed from the family budget made for lasting memories. Up until that time, uh, we made our wagons out of, uh, out of wooden wheels and wooden bodies and, and nailed them together out of scrap planks. But uh, this little red wagon uh, was, a, was a real jewel, and I remember pulling that little red wagon with my brother in it uh, all over the farm. It was, a, it was a real luxury item, and I don't know, it probably cost uh, maybe a, a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, a dollar and a half. And, that was a real sacrifice for my family to spend that much money at Christmas time to give me that kind of a luxury. But I'll always remember my first little red wagon at Christmas time. 
I've lived the past. I enjoyed my part of the past in the primitive days. And I hear those people say, uh, you know, let's go back to the good old days. I've already lived those days. I really don't want to go back. The crawfish, honey, they bored into the ground and kept on a boring till they unleashed the fountains of the earth. Uncle Remus. In deep southern Georgia lies the Okefenokee Swamp. Protected today as one of Georgia's most precious natural wonders, the Okefenokee's remote black waters and impenetrable vegetation were once regarded with fear and suspicion. Into this unlikely setting came a group of pioneer families who made the swamp their beloved home for over a hundred years. Homesteading on the low islands of the Okefenokee, the families lived a true frontier existence. Isolated and self-reliant, they created a lifestyle sustained peacefully by the natural abundance of the swamp around them. Okefenokee people, I think, the pendulum with them, even into the 1930s, was on independence. They were very independent people uh, who treasured the, the art of independence. Uh, the, and they were very proud of the fact that they didn't have to depend on anybody, society, or a government, or a business to, to keep them going. They were self-sufficient people. They could live on the land, trust their own instincts, preserve their values, and, and rear their children as they would like. The swamp families lived off the fruit of the land. They became one with the swamp, just as comfortable in their natural setting as the alligators and cypress. The land provided deer, bear, alligator, and ducks. They farmed pigs, chickens, sweet potatoes, sugar cane, and collards. What few things they couldn't grow or hunt, they bartered for with cane syrup, fur pelts and alligator hides. It was a way of life uniquely independent of the outside world. What made it so good is that we built everything by hand. Uh, all the buildings, the fences, uh, shelters and all. We, uh, we didn't go to town and buy the material. We, the only thing we bought was nails. We cut the, the small trees, the poles, and peel them and notched them and built a, a corn cribs and smokehouse, tobacco barns, and uh, all kind of outbuildings. Even even some of the dwelling houses, a lot of the dwelling houses that I've lived in has been built out of logs. My daddy was there from 18 and 84 to uh, 19 and 45. Had a seven room house. There was a screen porch all the way around. And he loved the swamp. He loved birds. It was a nice place to live. You could hear the wild turkeys every morning uh, yelping. And, um, and Dad, he got us some alligators and put them in the rain barrel. Now, they were fun. But you know, you can turn an alligator over and rub him on his stomach, and he'll go to sleep. Yeah. But then when it goes to rain, that is the most uh, fun to uh, watch them beller. I feel like this is uh, around the swamp here on these islands and all where I was raised. I, I just feel like it's home to me. Uh, I know when I came back from overseas, my, my uh, mother asked me one night, says, tell us about some of the pretty places you've seen. I said, I ain't seen nothing as pretty as the Okefenokee. I said <laughs> that I I said, if I ever get back, that's where I'll stay, is around the Okefenokee. On March 30th, 1937, an executive order created the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. The swamp settlers were slowly moved out of the Okefenokee. In 1959, the last family gave up their home place. For 104 years, true frontier families had lived on the Okefenokee. From that day forward, in five and nine, there would be no more.
For many Georgians, their first ABCs, their first multiplication tables, were learned in a little one-room schoolhouse. With 30 or 40 students of different ages, second-hand books, and often a teacher whose own education was limited, these schools, nevertheless, tried to provide a good basic schooling. Things just wasn't like it is now. You had to uh, probably had what you call the school pants and the school shoes. <laughs> so when you get when you when you leave school and get home, you take those clothes off and put on something else to go work in, in the field. <laughs> A typical one-room schoolhouse served rural Seabrook for nearly 50 years. Now a museum. It bears stark testimony to a time when going to school was a privilege newly won and a very different experience from today. We didn't get power in our hands for so much disciplinary problem because everybody seemed to have been pretty well disciplined. But if you didn't know your spelling words, you got a lick in your hand for each word that you missed. wood the boys would go out and gather wood that was their task and then we'd get in there and start the fire usually the teacher was there by the time we got a fire started well when it was time for us to eat lunch we all shared in fact you may have something I would like to have and we would swap or if I didn't have lunch at all another child may share might share with me but of course, my teacher is the one that I remember most that was shared with me. By the time Seabrook School closed its doors for good in 1947, it had grown to a full two rooms. Local residents once regarded the old school as a reminder of the dark days, something to be forgotten. But since restored, this simple building monuments a community's struggle and serves as a touchstone to our past. I used to hear my father say that uh, uh, if you could uh, do good on one of the crops each year, we could survive okay. And many times the cotton wouldn't do too good, the drought would get the corn, uh, had very few peanuts, but there again, we'd have a, a good year with the turpentine, so it would carry us through. In 1908, the booming American turpentine industry produced two million barrels. By 1938, the industry employed 20,000 people in Georgia alone. Gum, collected from the vast tracts of unused slash and longleaf pine forest, helped many a rural family survive. Turpentine workers spent long, hard weeks alone in the woods but jobs were nevertheless jumped at. It wasn't necessarily uh, in the rural areas of Georgia uh, a job in turpentine, it was a job period. There were, they were no jobs and, um, until World War II. Everybody, uh, a job was, you could, they, they wanted work. It, uh, it wasn't a question of price or time, it was, it was just a question of having, making any kind of livelihood they could. The first job I ever got was uh, dipping turpentine, and uh, they'd put, uh, they'd have cups on these turp these pine trees here, and you'd take a bucket and go around and dip all of this turpentine out of the cup, take the cup and scrape all the turpentine out into the bucket, then you carried it and poured it into a barrel. Well, the job that I got paid me 65 cents a barrel, and it would take all day, about as hard as you could go, to get a barrel, and uh, about a dirtier job as you ever got into, because I'd come in with turpentine all over me, my, in my hair, and on my hands, and on my clothes. Turpentine production has fallen from its turn-of-the-century high of 2 million barrels to just 2,000 
in 1995. Today, its Georgia workforce hovers at less than 50. It just began to come up again, you know, but a lot of young guys, they don't want the hard work. It's, a, it ain't, it's good money, but believe me, it's, it's some hard work <laughs> involved, you know. Irregardless of whether it ever comes back or not, it'll it's, uh, it's have a very dear spot in my heart, sure will. These shape note sounds carry across Georgia history. The sacred harp tradition was developed in the rural regions of our state in 1844, a time when people gathered without musical accompaniment to sing. The farmers would uh, toil the fields uh, for five days a week, and on Saturday they would go to town to uh, buy groceries and, and uh, see Miss Molly and, and do their regular chores. And then they would have singing schools, started having singing schools. And then on Sunday they would uh, go to their regular church and have, after church service, they would have dinner on the ground and they would have singings. And they would come from everywhere because they wouldn't any other recreation. They would do their courting there, they would do their uh, trading there, and they would get to see all their friends. So fa fa la la so fa so la so fa la so fa. When they would set a song, or key a song, uh, they would designate some uh, person there to do that because everybody can't key. And uh, they would try not to key them in the original key. They would key them in keys of convenience. They uh, would say, if the bass can reach the lowest note without grunting and the treble can sing the highest note without screaming, then it didn't make no difference what key it was in. It was convenient for them. Shape note singing was simple to learn. People enjoyed it so much that they meant to sing even if it wasn't a church Sunday. And sing they did from morning till night, many times straight through the weekend in keys of convenience. G.K. Chesterton once remarked, the traveler sees what he sees, the tripper sees what he has come to see. Life may have been simpler back then, but it wasn't all routine. Trips and vacations to the coast and mountains by rail and by road expanded our horizons with marvelous and mundane experiences. Remember stopping at Stuckey's? Just when you were desperate for a drink or snack or running out of gas, you'd see the signs. The signs was a big part of the Stuckey program. Uh, it was. Uh, almost necessary to have a lot of signs on each side of the store about a mile apart until uh, you got closer then they got down to half mile quarter mile and yards and so on you would advertise uh, the food items you know like giant milkshakes uh, hamburgers uh, fresh sandwiches uh, juice maybe one sign would say fudge one sign would say pecan log rolls and but it always said stop at Stuckey's and everybody did. Dad would always gas up the car, and then we would be sent in to go to the restroom, and we'd always have to weave our way through the store to find the restroom, and then on, on the way to the restroom, we would always locate some uh, toy, a rubber alligator, the uh, uh, whoopee cushion that we decided that we desperately needed, and uh, would try to coerce our parents into purchasing for us. Lured in by the candies and novelties, Clean restrooms and free ice water, travelers fueled Stuckey's growth. By its heyday in the 1970s, Stuckey's employed some 6,000 people in over 300 stores, all providing lots of sweet memories. Pecan log roll, uh, pecan divinity, uh, pecan uh, chocolate fudge and maple fudge. Goo goo clusters, uh, 
the uh, boxes of uh, pe uh, peanut brittle, uh, pralines. Stuffed dates, sugared spice pecans, toasted salted nuts. It was uh, uh, quite an assortment to choose from. It seemed as if back then things moved at a slower pace, that we weren't as uh, rushed and hurried to get to where we're going, and we actually spent time there. And we, it, when a stop wasn't a matter of, it wasn't as if we ran in, ran to the restroom and left. We stayed there, and, and, and a lot of the folks that worked there were, would visit with you, and they would have attendants there that would chat with you, and you know, it was the kind of place that you wanted to stay a little while once you, once you pulled off the road and not, not gas up and go like we do today. Back then you could meet an old fellow with an old ox wagon, and he'd stand there half the day if you wanted to talk. You meet a feller now, he'll run over you. Nobody's got no patience. Kenny Runyon. Buzzards roost, dog crossing, half acre. <laughs> Small towns with big names used to glide past as you drove along the state highways. Many looked far from prosperous even then. Once they might have held a cotton gin or turpentine still, a bank or two, any number of small stores, but now they found themselves nearly empty as farming declined. In most of these towns, life revolved around the general stores. That was the only place to come to, the store and the post office. Always a big crowd when the mail got put up in the morning. I remember back, uh, back then ordering something that went up on the afternoon train to Sears Roebuck, and they'd throw it off down here at the post office the next afternoon. That was good service. But the, that, was, that was when the town was most crowded, when they came in to check the mail. Osier Field, an old railroad town, is one of those small communities you may have passed through. It was once called Ocean Field because its low-lying ground turned to sea-like lakes whenever it rained. Back in uh, 1906, I believe, that's when it had uh, your cotton gin, your... Uh, uh, your turpentine steel, your hotel. You had a, we had a doctor here. Uh, we had a two-story hotel. Uh, it had a blacksmith shop. We had uh, about three or four grocery stores. One that's located was located right beside my store that burned, and a drugstore which had serviced the doctor too. It was a doctor and a drugstore. Today, all that remains of Osier Field is an old general store by the railroad track and lots of memories. Saturdays was one of your busiest days. That's when most all of the uh, uh, farm help came in to get their week's supply of groceries. And of course, it was put down on the little ticket in the box. And uh, that, uh, they, this store used to have uh, fresh meat, uh, the kind that you sliced your bologna and uh, you sold one slice of bologna, one slice of cheese. You had the big hoop cheese that you had to slice off. You had uh, loose crackers. Uh, you had uh, fresh fish once a week. And uh, of course you had the little five cent Coca-Cola too, that now is 69 cent. I always turned up here at the store at dinner time. I like honey buns and, uh, and moon pies and pint of milk and vine of sausages. Uh, Sardines, all that was good eating after you'd worked hard. And we all worked hard back then, it was all hand labor. I have pictures of it when the, most of the things were working here and some around the, the cotton gin that we had. But uh, I remember when all the signs were painted bright and we, we still on the map. You look on the Georgia map, we still on the map. We're just a bump in the road, but we're awfully proud of being at this particular bump. <laughs> weekend when my father was home from college, there was this visitor who said that she had spent much of her life traveling and had used this guidebook that was written by a man who listed seven beauty spots in the world. 
and she said she had been to all of them, but she wanted to add one to the list. And Dad asked her where was that, and she said, the mountains of northeast Georgia. For over a century, we've been escaping the heat and humidity of summer by traveling to Georgia's mountains. Today, almost a suburb of Atlanta, the mountain region used to offer a remote and different world, populated by stoic people who express themselves on the fiddle and in clay more easily than in words. In decades past, it would take a day or more of twisting mountain roads to reach our destinations. But the lure of cool breezes, clear lakes, and breathtaking views pulled us northward, especially to Tallulah Falls. And at that time, there were mountain hotels built along the uh, cliff overlooking the falls, which was a big attraction. and, and uh, and uh, people came in the summer, they came by horse and buggy, or they came on the little train that came as far as Franklin. People came from Atlanta to Cornelia and transferred in Cornelia to the little total failure, as the Tallulah Falls Railway was called, and then they came to Tallulah Falls. Visitors cut across social and economic lines from traveling salesmen to city dwellers arriving in chauffeured automobiles. They whiled away the hours swimming and boating, hiking and riding. It was a short-lived heyday. In 1913, a hydroelectric dam turned Tallulah Falls into Tallulah Gorge, ending its days as a summer retreat. Today, the mountains are on our doorstep, linked to us by highways that have turned journeys into easy trips and adventures into simple outings. Giving northerners unbuttered instant grits is an old remedy for getting rid of tourists. Louis Grizzard. A second northern invasion, after the Civil War, took some of the most beautiful areas of Georgia as exclusive winter retreats. In the early 1900s, some household names came south looking for a winter getaway. J.P. Morgan, William Rockefeller, and Theodore Invell were among the richest men in the country when a Georgia island called Jekyll caught their eye. They named their little piece of paradise the Jekyll Island Club. It started out mainly as a hunting club, but soon developed into a two-week winter retreat for New York City's finest families. By 1915, the wealth and prestige of that membership had grown to the point where they controlled about one-sixth of the wealth of the world. The club operated from January through April as a winter retreat. Most of these people belonged in the summertime to the Adirondacks Lake Club and of course lived in New York, Philadelphia and larger cities in the Northeast. They would come down here to escape the rigors of the winters and stay for about two weeks. Those who wanted to uh, stay longer than that might build a cottage such as this one. There are few other so-called cottages in Georgia that have 17 bathrooms courtyard swimming pools and 40-foot solariums. They would bring their entire entourage with them, their entire family, the maids, uh, governesses and so forth would come with them and really maintain, although in their eyes, a much more simple way of life than what they had uh, in their, their home uh, state. Uh, nonetheless, it was not uncommon for them to change clothes seven times a day and in one case, uh, the Macy family where the governess is recorded a lot of that information, they brought 22 steamer trunks for the wife for a seven-day visit. Club members came to Jekyll then for the same reasons we would today. The beach, golf, play, and solitude. But the island paradise was to be short-lived. Death and taxis caught up with the millionaires. The 1930s so it was a decade in which a series of events occurred which made it very difficult for these people to accumulate wealth and to pass the wealth on to their children. Uh, first of all was the estate taxes which made it difficult for them to take the money they had accumulated in their lifetime and pass it to their children and that's still uh, with us today but the sort of wealth that these people had to give up 30, 40, 50 percent of that 
uh, off the top and then divide it between the children. Two or three generations later, there's not a lot left. After the war, there simply was not enough interest on the part of the club members to reopen the club to make it uh, successful. And in 1947, it was sold to the state of Georgia for $600,000. Tom Coffey, a young newspaper man, gleefully wrote of the club's 1947 closing. With the state's buyout of the Jekyll Island Club, it is still safe for us to operate on the theory that a Yankee is worth more than a bale of cotton and is twice as easy to pick. A more populous beach resort grew up on Tybee Island, where Georgians flocked to escape the summer heat and humidity. As one Savannah woman wrote, the weather here is so hot that many days you can see it. The, the population of Tybee Island was not a year-round uh, residency. The population of Tybee was mostly just summer residents who came from Savannah primarily to escape the stagnant summer air there and take advantage of the, the sea breezes on Tybee. Tybee Island lay not a two-hour train ride due east from Savannah. Get on the train down on the, on the east side of town, on President Street, and uh, the train went through, went over causeways and bridges through the marshes and past Fort Pulaski and on to Tybee. And the people would get off and spend the day at Tybee. It was a real gathering place for, for Savannah people to have fun. By the 1930s, Tybee was a booming beach resort with numerous summer cottages and several fine hotels strung along its shore. This was the only beach in this area. This was the only getaway, the only real resort area. At that time, it was a wide open uh, beach resort, so people really just mushroomed as far as the number of daily visitations go. So there could be anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people throughout the weekend here on Tybee Island. Tybee became a cool destination where kids of all ages swam by day and danced the warm, lingering summer nights away. Well, Tybee was heaven on earth for the young and the old. <clears throat> we had the run of the island. We spent all summer just having fun. We were in the water, we were in the, on the beach. At night time, we went down to the pavilion and danced. I walked on the beach. It was, it was wonderful. Well, no, the men were not allowed to wear um, topless bathing suits as they do today. It had to be an all one piece suit. And um, if they would just even pull the shoulder strap off sometime, the lifeguard would go up and tap him on the shoulder and say, put your strap back up. <laughs> it's against the law. <laughs> it was against the law. With lieutenants and privates spilling out from nearby Fort Screven, and girls aplenty arriving by both train and car, the famous Tybrisa Dance Pavilion jumped to a humid mix of laughter, big band sounds, and stolen kisses under the pier. Boy would come up and tag the girl on the boy on the shoulder rather than he'd step aside and then he'd dance with the boy and they tagged it. And the more tags you get, the more popular you were. Yeah, it, they broke in is what it was. They would break into a dance. But if you sat and danced too long with one, see, that wasn't too good. You were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Tybee's star waned as better roads and more cars widened our horizons. The Tybrisa's lights slowly dimmed. The railway from Savannah stopped running, and most of the hotels closed. It would be many years before we discovered again the heaven on earth that is Tybee. Zippity doo da, zippity eh. Johnny Mercer traveled further than most, but in many ways, never left home. As America's greatest lyricist, Mercer was a down home Georgia man who wrote lovingly about his home state. His most famous song, Moon River, was a fond remembrance of the small tidal creek that ran behind his Savannah childhood home. But before Mercer started to write, he wanted to act. And to do that, he had to get to New York. So they decided to stow away on an ocean liner that was plying between Savannah, New York, and Boston. 
Well, they stowed away, but were caught halfway to New York, and they were ma be made to uh, work the other half until they let him off in New York. Johnny's uh, ambition was to be an actor, but uh, his uh, natural talent, obviously, was in songs and lyric writing, and quickly the acting part gave way. Luck smiled on Johnny Mercer. In 1935, Mercer moved to Los Angeles and just three years later had his first Academy Award nomination for Jeepers Creepers. Mercer is acknowledged by most of his colleagues to be the greatest lyricist and songwriter in terms of use of vernacular American speech. Most of his, his best known works, um, songs like Accentuate the Positive, Goody Goody, even the lesser known ones, P.S. I Love You, took very simple phrases that people use every day and then made magnificent works of art out of them. Very few other lyricists used American speech that way. They used the English language. Over his career, Mercer would receive 18 Academy nominations and four Academy Awards for such songs as Accentuate the Positive, On the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe, Moon River, and Days of Wine and Roses. Some of his, his composer colleagues laughed at his, his way of doing work, which was frequently to lie back on a couch and sort of stare off into space and maybe to take a snooze. And um, one of his colleagues, I think it was Harry Warren, named him Cloud Boy. It was the, the creative muse working in his way, which was just to relax and kind of let it come. Mercer never strayed far from his Georgia down-home feelings. He called on the memories of his youth birds, meadows, rivers, and trains to set his songs in a unique southern vernacular. Well, the Savannians uh, have never fallen out of love with Johnny Mercer. They've loved him all his life because he was a very unassuming fellow despite his fame and popularity. He wanted to be a regular fellow, a regular citizen. Good old Johnny Mercer, that's all. Mercer left an indelible impression on American popular music. His legacy colored our lives and still stirs strong memories in all of us, including Emma Kelly, Savannah's lady of a thousand songs. Johnny, wherever you are, we love you and we miss you so terribly, but you're right here in our hearts. Was it dusty on the train? Savannah is both beauty and history. There's a special charm to its way of life. Breathtaking squares, elegant homes, lush gardens. But rarely do you hear of the treasure that Savannah lost. City Market was one of the hubs of commerce downtown. Uh, vendors uh, rented spaces in the market. It was uh, it had produce dealers, uh, uh, fish dealers, had uh, uh, a restaurant in there, uh, and all sorts of, uh, of goods were sold. It's, it's sort of, it was like a citified farmer's market. The Savannah City Market, built in 1872, sat on a downtown square just two blocks from the river. It was the city's commercial meeting place, where gossip and commerce intersected. Kosher uh, chicken man was Mr. Cosman. Uh, Mr. Madden was in the meat business. Mr. Moksovitz was still Moksovitz Produce. He was a produce man and muse. We had Mr. Freeze in the chicken business. The Matthews were in the fish business. And uh, uh, there were various and sundry kinds of independent small farmers that would come to town and huckster their beans and peas that they picked and shucked and, and uh, woven uh, grass woven platters that they would put them in. I think the whole thing in the city market was person-to-person -person contact, people-to-people, -people, eyeball to eyeball, friend to friend, competitor to competitor, you know. It, it was a whole lot of, uh, of fun trying to outdo the other guy. When you lose the fun, you lose everything. The thing I remember best about the city bar is how it smelled. It didn't smell bad. 
You smell fish, but fish to me do not smell bad. Fish, fish smell, smell good because I like to eat fish. Uh, but uh, you, you could smell the fish and then you would smell the, the, the produce, the, the greens, uh, the turnip greens and things that they sold had a, a, a peculiar sort of smell, a, a distinctive smell. And uh, you had all this, this blend of smells as you went in the market. It was kind of romantic. I, I used to love going in the market, just walking through. We sold fish in the 30s for a nickel a pound, three pounds for a dime, a shovel full for a quarter. And the, the phrase was, a nickel, a nickel, a nickel, a nickel, a nickel, a come and get it, you know, come over and get it. We strung the fish up on uh, palmetto branches. And we'd tie a knot in the bottom and we'd string the fish on this side and this side and tie a knot in. We'd sell you a, a string of fish for a quarter. And we didn't know anything about cleaning them or wrapping them or all that kind of stuff. You just take your string of fish and go for a quarter. Uh, this goes back in the 30s. It got better than that in the 40s and 50s. But that's how it was originally in the old days. The 50s saw the demise of the colorful old city market pulled down for a parking lot. But the loss of the city market pushed the city's preservation movement into action. As a result, Savannah today is one of the world's most beautiful cities. Georgia man and a Georgia woman is synonymous with the word love. Cornelia Wallace. During the 1930s, our luck just about ran out. The boll weevil had bedeviled science and wrecked the economy. Small rural towns such as Possum Trot, Lick Skillet, and Frog Bottom were disappearing from Georgia's map. Farm labor was on the move in search of jobs, any job. Many rural people turned to the textile industry for work, and with the textile mills came mill villages. Mill villages were designed to give people a place to live that was near, their, near the mills. You had several hundred people suddenly working for this mill, and uh, this was several hundred people that hadn't been living in town before, and they had to have somewhere to live. And so it was just, you built the mill, you built the houses. It was something that the mill owners almost automatically did in that day and time. The workers' houses were owned by the mill and rented to them through withheld wages. The village often ascended a hillside with job title and family size moving in orderly progress up the grade. At the bottom were brick tenements, then duplexes and single family homes. At the top or nearest the mill, would be the superintendent's home. My father and mother both worked at the mill. And as the children began to grow up, when they got of age, they went to work in the mill. Uh, at one time, I had three brothers and six sisters. And at one time, all three brothers was working and all worked in the same department, and, uh, which was a weave room, which is where my father worked. Life was hard, each day regulated by the sound of the mill whistle. They blew the whistle. They had a, a, each mill had its own smokestack and whistle, and uh, and none of them had the same sound. And you can tell this is good which whistle was blowing. You learn to know who's a, a first one. And you say, "Oh, that's Am City." <laughs> we used to try to see who get it first. You know who which mill was blowing, and then it blew in the late afternoon when you when the mill let out, and every morning about four o'clock. They'd blow the whistle and get be sure everybody was awake, so they'd be in, in the mill before 6 o'clock to go to work. Mill villagers often kept away from nearby towns and outsiders and became very close-knit communities. On the village, everybody knew, not only everybody on the street, but everybody on the village. And it was a sense of, of belonging that everybody had. It didn't matter. Uh, you knew who they were. You knew who their parents were. You knew what... A department they worked in, um, you knew what church they went to, you knew if they were in scouts or not. I mean, you knew everything about them. It was just like an extended family. Although mill work meant low pay and long hours, some mill owners tried to protect their workers from the ravages of the Depression. 
during the Depression, the Callaways tried to make sure that at least one family member was employed at full wage. And this was a time when the mills themselves were not doing well economically. They were uh, having to warehouse their products and save them for better times, but they still they were concerned about the families. After the war, the advent of affordable transportation made mill villages unnecessary. And by the late 1940s, most mill village homes had been sold to the employees. My children grew up in the metropolitan area. And I see a lot of things that I feel like that they missed that I took for granted. That sense of security, uh, sense of belonging is one of the things that I think is, has been lost and one of the things that I really cherish. Not so long ago, Atlanta was ringed with farmland. Today's suburban subdivisions and shopping malls were built on dairy farms, worked for generations by the same families. On one rolling pasture land east of Atlanta, Georgia's first true 60s superstar was born. Established way back in 1919 with three cows, Mathis Dairy would reach international fame for a succession of gentle female bovines named Rosebud. You see, Rosebud was not just any cow. Rosebud was a happening, a kid's farm fantasy come true. It started in the early 1950s with uh, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, and in order for them to get a badge, uh, they had to visit a dairy farm. We had a herdsman at that time, Mr. Wade, that was in charge of taking these Cub Scouts through the dairy. And it was his idea to let them pet a Guernsey cow that we had that was very gentle. Uh, gentle, and then uh, they petted the cow, and then he asked them if any of them would like to, to milk the cow. And that's how it started. And, and we didn't think anything about it till the parents of these kids would call later and said that my son had so much fun milking your cow that we'd like to come back and bring our other children. Sometimes waiting for two or three months for a tour, over the years, thousands of children were changed by the Rosebud experience. At that time, you didn't have animals uh, around town. Grant Park was small at that period of time, and for a child to see the full cows, to get up to a cow, to touch a cow, and especially the calves. Now, I, I think they saw, I got as much out of the little calves, seeing the calves. But, of course, the highlight was Rosebud, and touching Rosebud, that was, that was outstanding. And when they got that pen that says, I milked Rosebud, that was a badge of courage. They always wanted to be squirted. That, that was uh, something that, uh, you know, you had to be squirted with fresh milk. Of course, a lot of them wanted to get a mouthful of fresh milk. And, uh, they would uh, get down where they could get the mouthful of fresh milk, and we'd oblige them with the fresh milk. But they, they, they preferred the cold milk to the hot milk. It was fresh, but uh, not like the cold milk. I've been doing some business in, in uh, former Soviet Union and and uh, I had two different individuals with, uh, that didn't know each other, both of them living in Moscow and ran across them at the American Embassy and had two different individuals to ask me, 8,000 miles away from home, how was Rosebud and they both had milk Rosebud. It was an experience never to be forgotten and one that today's children cannot have. In the early 1970s is when we had to move the move the cows to, to other farms and uh, we had to stop the tours. And so because of the city was just growing out to us. And uh, so that's when the tours actually stopped. It really, it really hurt us as much as it did the, you know, the kids of Atlanta. And then recently we had the building where it all started in 1917. It, it, uh, it burned and we had a lot of people calling and uh, were broken hearted that, they, that the old uh, farm had, uh, had finally burned. One of the best things a man can do for his son is pass along a love of baseball. Louis Grizzard. Swung, fly ball, deep left center, Grissom on the run! Yes! 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 The Atlanta Braves have given you a championship! Listen to this crowd! With the Braves' move to Fulton County Stadium in 1966, 
the South had secured its first major league sports franchise. And with the Braves came the greatest slugger that baseball has ever known, hammering Hank Aaron. Billy Bruton, many years ago, used to tell me that um, you put into the game what you get out of it. You know, if you come into the game of baseball, no matter whether it's baseball or whatever it may be, if you work very hard, you're going to have a glorious career. I took every play very serious. Uh, I went to the bat very serious. I studied the game. I knew what I wanted to do. In his 23-year career, Aaron would play in 24 All-Star games. He dominated the league and rewrote the record books for most runs batted in, total bases, and most home runs in a career, 755. Many of his record-breaking feats took place right in our own Fulton County Stadium. It was a great place for me. You know, really, the ballpark was great for me. It was, it was, it was geared for my type of hitting, you know, really. I enjoyed playing here. I always felt that... Uh, in this ballpark that I could always, if I walked out on the field, that I could always hit a home run. In this same friendly stadium, on April 8, 1974, Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record for home runs, slamming number 715 out of the park. Swinging, there's a drive into left center field. That ball is gonna be out of here. It's gone, it's 715. I don't know that you're ever going to see that kind of drama again, not as far as me, but as far as the stands, the people in the stands, you know, they enjoyed themselves. Uh, I think the most important thing was the fact that uh, my mother and father was, was able to be here. But, but overall, I think that the fans had a wonderful time, and I was able to, 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 uh, to put myself in history, you know, and, uh, and they put themselves in history here when I hit the home run. He'll be remembered as a, as a guy who just loved to play baseball, a fellow who not only set the home run record, but he has other records that'll stand. Uh, I don't think they'll ever break Hank Aaron's record, so I think it's 755 home runs all time. And uh, I don't think that'll ever be broken. And so he's going to be able to say that for the, and his grandkids too, that uh, my dad hit more home runs than anyone else in baseball. Henry Aaron, who two years ago seriously announced that he was going to challenge the great Bambino, has done it here tonight, Monday night, April the 8th, 1974. Baseball covets its heroes, but Fulton County Stadium, the house where Aaron set so many of his records, will be torn down in the fall of 96 to make room for another parking lot. So much of Georgia's past has vanished. People, places, lifestyles are gone in the blink of an eye. But the South is long on tradition and strong in storytelling. As long as we have memories and share them, as long as we listen well and pass on our stories, the past will never be lost completely. With his last breath, Booker T. Washington said, Take me home. I was born in the South. I have lived and labored in the South. And I wish to die and be buried in the South. You'll not find many of us who would disagree. <laughs> <laughs>